Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for Academy Talks Ways and Means, Framing Documentary Narratives Through Editing and Sound, presented by the City of Toronto. My name is Katie Elder, and I'm the Senior Manager of Programming and Membership at the Canadian Academy. Before we begin, the Academy is located in Toronto and would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I would also like to recognize the extraordinary strength and struggle of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous people who have man maintained their culture in the face of forces who have actively tried to erase their culture. The Canadian Academy acknowledges the role that the media establishment has played in those scenarios, and we are committed to forging a path forward that is respectful and inclusive. And as we are connecting virtually today from different places on the map, we encourage you to go to native-land.ca and learn about the nations and traditional lands on which you reside. A few housekeeping notes before we get started today. So at the bottom of your screen, there are two buttons. One is labeled chat and another is labeled Q&A. If you wish to chat or make a comment during the panel, please use the chat function. When you're posting, don't forget to use the little drop down menu that's in the chat box um, and post to both panelists and attendees so that everyone on today's call can see your comments. Use the Q&A function to drop any questions you have for today's speakers and we'll save some time at the end of today's presentation to answer those. Um, please make sure that you put your questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box. It's helpful for us to have them all in one space there and easier for us to answer them at the end of the panel. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. So if you'd like to learn anything more about today's speakers, we've included a link in the chat with their full bios. First, we have Carol Larson. So Carol is a award-winning documentary editor specializing in stories of our relationship with animals and the environment. Recent projects include the documentaries Rebellion, She Walks with Apes, and Equator, A New World View, which is a look at the ribbon of biodiversity that circles the planet. Next, we have composer Darren Fung. Darren is a three-time Canadian Screen Award winner with over 100 composition credits to his name. His recent credits include Niobe Thompson's The Great Human Odyssey and Equus Story of the Horse, a recreation of Canada's beloved hockey theme for CTV and TSN, the theme music for Canada AM, and his film scores have been heard at prestigious film festivals around the world, including, including Toronto, Cannes, and Sundance. Next, we have Matthew Chan. Matthew is a re-recording mixer and sound supervisor with nearly two decades of experience working in feature film, documentary, and television. Matt recently worked on Liz Marshall's Meet the Future, for which he and the sound team were nominated for a 2021 Canadian Screen Award. Next, we have Shi Feng. She is a Chinese-Canadian film editor based in Montreal. Having lived in China, Canada, and France, she has cultivated a unique blend of cultural and artistic sensitivity. She has worked as an editor on several award-winning documentaries, including China Heavyweight, Sing Me a Lullaby, and Clubs. And I will pass it off to our moderator for the session, Julian Carrington. Julian is a funds programmer and distribution manager at the Hot Box International Documentary Film Festival. In addition to administering Hot Docs Film Funds, he oversees the festival's distribution marketplace, including the Distribution Rendezvous Pitch Meeting Program and the Doc Shop, the festival's on-demand industry screening library. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for, for having us. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be involved in today's conversation and to be able to share the panel with a really talented collection of artists and technicians. Uh, I know we had some brief bios off the top, but maybe to begin with, I can ask each of you to tell us a little bit more about your specific practices. Uh, I'd love to know more about what you uh, do on a production and how you work in conjunction with a director. So maybe, uh, Darren, I can start with you. Um, thanks, Julian, and, and, and thanks for having us here. Um, so as a composer, I basically write, um, I write music specifically for the picture. Um, and that involves, um, you know, look, coming in usually around sometime between uh, rough and final cut. And we go over, you know, we go over the, the production with, you know, the director, sometimes the editor. And we basically go over in terms of what they want music to accomplish. So that often includes, you know, um, you know, what, what voice do you want the music to play? What emotion are you looking for? Um, what sort of reference points are you looking for, like from other music, you know, like, like the temp music and all of that. 
Um, and then it's my job to basically kind of translate those emotional, those emotions into music. Uh, and then we do a back and forth and we haggle, uh, you know, we haggle back and forth uh, based on based on what the director wants and what I want. And then, usually the, you know, the director usually wins. And um, and then we go back and forth and, and depending on, uh, and then so production of the final music is also obviously my responsibility. So sometimes we, you know, on lower budget productions, it's just a completely digital thing. So it's all synth only, but on bigger productions, like uh, some of the things, things that I've worked on, you know, we get to go pull in a full orchestra and record all that. And so that includes project management and overseeing everything to the delivery to people like Matt, who then curse us for not doing things you know, that he wants. It, so. Well, that's a that's a perfect uh, transition, Matt. Uh, why why might you be cursing someone like Darren? What what is your role in a production? Well, that's not. Uh, I would never curse Darren. Um, uh, the face, sound <laughs> uh, the sound supervision um, is often done by a sound editor. I'm a bit of an oddball because I'm really a, a mixer, um, but the sound supervisor um, works in tandem, like works with the director to sort of craft the sound design, the soundscape of the film. Um, and it brings in dialogue elements, uh, sound effects fully in music. And then as a mixer, I bring all those elements together with the director in the studio mixing in 5.1 or um, an immersive format or something like that. Awesome. And uh, Carol, how about you? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm a mainly documentary editor. Uh, I work closely with the director if there's a separate writer with them as well, and, and with, of course, the producer um, crafting the film from the ground up. Uh, if I'm lucky, sometimes I get to be brought on before they start shooting. So I can be involved in the discussion of what, uh, what the approach is gonna be. And uh, sometimes I, I arrive and there's already a paper edit done and the director has been through everything. And I work with them from that point. Sometimes we just start from the beginning. They haven't seen it, I haven't seen it. And we work our way through the material to um, to make the story. And she, you're you're also uh, an editor. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your practice? Thanks for having us. And uh, um, I mainly work as a documentary editor as well since the last decade. And uh, recently, I've been also expanding my practice to fiction films and animation shorts. So, which are like very interesting differences in those um, formats. Um, I mainly, in documentary film, we uh, work for a long time during the editing process with the director. So sometime I would build an uh, assembly first and then work with the director, but sometime we would just work along throughout the whole process. And normally it's a digesting process of enormous amount of footage. And that can last for like from, you know, like a, a a hundred hours or even 300 hours. So it's to carve the story and out from those footage and then to find the structure and the proper form of the, the story. I would say it's a storytelling, uh, it's a storytelling profession, but it's also a problem solving profession. Mm -hmm. And we can also serve as sometime as the therapist of the directors. <laughs> Uh, I'm particularly interested in that storytelling component in, in documentary editing. Um, Carol, did you, have you also worked in, in fiction films in addition to documentaries in the past? Yeah. You have, I, okay. I've, I've cut uh, three no budget features. G got it. <laughs> one so, of which saw the light of day, the other ones didn't, and that's okay. <laughs> Well, the, the, the important thing is that you've had the experience of both. And, and so I'm wondering, um, if maybe uh, Carol and she, uh, I can I can ask you to elaborate a little bit on um, maybe some of the differences uh, in working uh, as an editor on a fiction film versus a, a documentary. And she, you were um, speaking to a point that I wanted to maybe draw out a little bit, which is that um, editors play a particularly significant role in giving shape and structure to a story in documentary, whereas I think in narrative, you know, that's more so associated with the, the writing process. So um, yeah, can you maybe just expand on that a little bit and talk a bit about the unique um, role that a documentary editor plays? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Julie. And I think the, the main difference is, is the focus of the work 
um, that are different from cutting fiction and documentary, which is like the pre-production process of the script writing is happening uh, in the post for documentary film. So we have like, we feel like we have a bag of words or a bag of sentences, and then we have to make the script from that bag of words in documentary films. That's, our, that's the differences between the fiction and documentary. And then fiction, I feel like we have a lot more focus on individual scenes and within individual scenes, there are a lot more choices. Whereas in documentary films, there are generally a lot of choices on how the story, where the story will be going. So there are a lot of structural um, choices to make in, in doing a documentary film. And then it can make the, make, we can easily make 10 different films out of the same, um, same footage. Whereas in, in fiction, I feel like we are, the main focus is to find the emotional arc. It's to fine tuning what has already been shot and then to uh, tackle some of the problems during productions or um, to find a rhythm and find the, like, the best take. And there are more choices in terms of the micro uh, aspect in terms of like documentary films who have more choice in the macro senses. Mm. Carol, uh, I'm, I'm curious about your approach as well. So you obviously are dealing with uh, enormous amounts of footage and also having to, to, to shape in that way. Yeah, for um, She Walks With Apes, I did a, a ballpark measurement of how much footage they, they, they shot for three weeks in three different locations. So in essence, I had nine weeks of material to, to work with. So it's a lot. Um, and sometimes we're so overwhelmed with raw footage that it's hard to look at nuances within individual shots. You're just looking for the, the larger things and hopefully you get your structure down so that you have time to go in and really, really work the nuances of, of a scene. Um, and I think having been a fiction editor with shorts and features, even the little bit that I did gave me some sense of um, paying attention to character um, the little moments that reveal somebody as a person. Uh, I added a lot of science and, and nature stuff and, and paying attention to somebody giving an interview in a lab coat, it's not interesting to me unless I get a sense of them as a person mm -hmm. and, and why they love the thing that they're doing. And so I think that having done fiction helps me do documentary as well. When you are each... Um shaping a documentary narrative. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how common is it that you're doing that sort of side by side with the director? Or is it often the case that, you know, you're sort of taking the footage, the director is not present, you're having an initial crack at it, and then you're coming in and, and iterating together? Or how do you, how does that process unfold? For me, it depends on whether they're still shooting or not, for the most part. Uh, for TV docs, especially, we're on tight deadlines. So uh, the director is pretty much with me all the time, even if they say they're going to leave me alone. A lot of times <laughs> they have trouble leaving the edit room because um, they've been living with this film for you know a year or two or three before we actually start cutting it. So it's hard for them to to step away even for a moment. Um, I like that collaboration. I think mm -hmm. that it, it it helps me, but I also enjoy being able to you know have a crack at the footage myself. But I, I think that 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 feels more rare these days mm. not. and I think it has a lot to do with schedules more than more than preference. She what's your experience? Oh, I feel like I have been lucky that I have worked on films where the director will often allow me a certain amount of time to just explore my my versions or um, we have a, or I have a lot of time to do my own things in between cuts and then we have meetings. So that happens a lot more in feature films and also like in sometimes I work with overseas projects. So we, we have this like long distance relationship already mm. or across province. So if I collaborate with a Toronto based director and then I'm based in Montreal. So sometimes that doesn't allow us to work together very often, but I, I feel like that has allowed me to have more time on my own to explore. Got it. Um, Darren and, and Matthew, I'm curious as well in your roles, are there any uh, sort of unique approaches that you take when you're working on a documentary project? Uh, for instance, Darren, I wonder, um, do you find that documentary scores 
uh, function differently than than fiction scores? Are they more you know understated typically, for instance, or or how do you find the comparison? No, it's a great question, Julian. And and I've always said that like you know my job, I think, between a fiction and like a narrative and, and a documentary, I don't see it as being very different, and I don't approach it particularly differently. It's because it's all based down to story. What's really interesting is that what what she was saying was that how you have a lot more, I, I think, power, I think, as a composer, because I think when you're going into a fic, you know, and, and when you're looking at scoring a fiction film, the narrative has already been decided for you, right? And you need to know, but oftentimes, you know, I've often gone to a director and said like, hey, what if we approach it this way? You know, what if, you know, I just, I, I have this idea, you want to just check it out and, and you know sometimes you win it sometimes you lose it but I, but I, I think it's always really interesting being part of that that decision making process as well too um that being said you know when you're usually by the time you hit the music stage hit the music stage you're usually out of time <laughs> and out of money so so there's not really that much time to play around with stuff but you know if there's something you feel strongly about you're usually you know there is that opportunity and that depends very much on your relationship with the director so. got it um, Matthew, same question to you. I'm wondering whether there are significant differences in how you work with documentary projects as opposed to fiction projects, or um, you know whether there actually might be more similarities than than people might assume. Uh, I feel like there might actually be a greater amount of uh, editorial intervention in the soundscape of documentaries than people sometimes realize. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, similar to Darren, I don't see too much a difference from how I approach a project. Um, you know, the story and the form of the project really dictate what the sound is going to be. And, and certainly in terms of like the amount of sound that's being crafted into a documentary versus a, a fiction film, it's not much different. Um, the only real difference is there's certain things anchored into a documentary that you simply can't replace. You can't replace, you know, a principal subject's interviews uh, very easily without going back and reshooting that person. So. But in terms of when you watch a documentary and you're like, oh, wow, like listen to that, you know, rich soundscape and sound design, how did they capture all that on the spot? I, I guarantee you they replaced all of it pretty much. So that's usually what happens. Actually, that your, your point about not being able to replace a principal subjects um, interview reminds me of a note that we often give to filmmakers, especially emerging ones, about the importance of sound and how if there's like one thing you need to capture in a polished way in a documentary, it's actually the sound because you can you can layer that over images, you can kind of cut around and, and maybe this is an opportunity uh, she, you, you can maybe, and, and Carol talk about um, how you can work with the visuals in, in sort of a flexible way, but, but, but the audio is sort of all important in some ways. Is that, is that fair to say? <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it's a, it makes a huge difference. We can, um, we can only do so much. I think everybody's heard the term Frankenbite or Franken edit. You can take two parts of a, of an interview, say somebody answers a question and they've given you three paragraphs and you take the first sentence and the last sentence and the middle sentence and, you know, work it to make one coherent sentence. Um, and ideally it, it flows and, and sounds perfectly, um, and we can we can put that over anything. You just choose the if you're doing a talking head situation, you choose the right moment to see their faces when they're saying something really important, and the rest of it you can put off camera. Um, hopefully, with images that help you tell that story. Um, but if you have bad sound, you're you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so many fixes you can do, uh, in most ways. Mm. Yeah, for my experience, I have been working on a lot of uh, films that happen to be in a more of a cinema verite form, and which is like a theatrical documentary that's very focused on the character driven story or uh, a dramatic arc of the story. So it's, it's very, very important to have a good sound design. And normally it's uh, during the production is already double system. So it's characters are loved and and um, I think like from my experience I always found it like I'm watching a different film whenever it's released 
because when we were doing when we were doing the editing, a lot of elements were not added in, and the sound was a lot flatter and then a lot like um, empty. And then, but like within with the sound design and and mix, it really make it very very cinematic. So I I do think it's a it's a huge uh, hugely important element for documentary film, especially for theatrical film. Hmm. Um, she, I'd actually like to stay with you for a moment because you mentioned something on our prep call uh, for this conversation that I thought uh, was was a great topic to explore, and, and and I'd love to open it up to the full panel afterwards. But you uh, expressed that you felt that there's a convergence happening between uh, documentary filmmaking and fiction filmmaking, and that increasingly they're sort of borrowing the formal um, techniques of one another. So I'd love I'd love to hear a bit more about that and, and your experience of that. Yeah, I do feel like during the, because I was mainly focused on theatrical docs that are like feature length. And so there was a tendency of having theatrical doc being more and more short story driven. There were criticism about that as well, but then they look more and more, more, and more like fiction um, over the years. And then there was also experimental and creative documentary format that are exploring artistic expression in documentary, which I found very interesting because I personally think that documentary film is also a form of cinema. Mm. This maybe comes from my encounter with the French school and, you know, the, the auto cinema. And it, it is very important to have a director's perspective and point of view and treatment even if it's a documentary, because it represents the, the writer or the writer or the director's point of view and their artistic pursue, even as it's a documentary film. There are so many artistic ways to explore it. So that's why I've, I found this is one of the tendencies um, in doc. And then in fiction, I think the pursuit of realism has gotten like this I feel like there are more and more fiction that are exploring uh, the, the more improvisational shooting style or then the, the non-acting performance or even like with Chloe Zhao's recent film, she mm. incorporated documentary uh, elements into the, the fiction story. And in both of her films, I think there was like passage with bonfire and then real people in the community talk about their experience and stories. And then I found that very interesting in terms of like this hybrid thing happening in both formats. Mm, yeah, Chloe Zhao is a great example is that uh, as are the Safdie brothers, I feel like they use a lot of mm -hmm. sort of documentary style elements. Um, curious for the rest of the panel, uh, do, do any of you have, have thoughts on this phenomenon? I, I just see it all the time. Like it's the lines are blurring, like always, you know, and I think it's great. I'm no purist. So I think it's really interesting. And I think, you know, the voice of any project is through the director. And I, I don't think I've ever really worked on something where I've been taxed, tasked or asked, or even considered that this is some sort of objectively, you know, truthful presentation. It's always been through, through the lens of the, the director's voice, so. You know, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, two of the large projects that I've worked on in the past few years, um, there's been a great focus on actually doing, you know, reenactments and, and, and historical sort of, you know, um, you know, these are natural history, these are natural, natural history films, and there's a large focus on, on telling the story um, through these historical reenactments and getting, getting a large sense of drama from there. And that, from a composer standpoint, is a lot of fun because, you know, you get to write these big, epic, uh, epic scoring moments as opposed to, you know, underscoring the talking head in the lab coat, right? So um, for me, you know, from, from an artist's perspective, I think it's great. And, uh, and again, that blurring the line is, is constantly happening. The, the blurring the line is constantly happening, I think, so. Yeah, I think documentary, as I, as I think I said in an earlier conversation, I think it starts with, or started with the view that it's journalism. And that we let that go in documentary is this huge genre now. There's so much, so many ways of telling a story and it is the director's point of view or it's the director's choice of how they're trying to interpret their subject's point of view. Um, but I think there has to be, um, or not has to be, I think there should be a discussion within the, the filmmaking team about what their, their objective is and how, how, 
how they define the truth of the story. Um, are they being, are they trying to be objective and pre present uh, a clinical look at something or are they trying to be intimate and, you know, tell that story in a, in a really particular uh, way that, you know, allows you an inside view inside somebody's head. It's, it's infinite. There's just, there's just a wonderful infinite way of telling stories these days. And why should we be restricted? Mm. Uh, Carol, that actually sets up really nicely uh, sort of the next direction I wanted to take the conversation in, which, you know, the framing of this panel um, touched on uh, not just sort of craft and, and creating meaning, but also ethics. So I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the ethical considerations that begin to come into play as documentaries are increasingly adopting the sort of grammar and styling of fiction films. I'm wondering when you are making a creative intervention in a project, do you find yourself uh, having to balance sort of the artistic value of an intervention against its, uh, like its truth implications perhaps? Um, it, I'll, I'll stick with you, Carol, for that first and then I'll, I'll, I'll open it up. I, I think there is, um where there tends to be ethical discussions. Are we, are we representing something accurately or have we imposed too much of ourselves on it? And my little phrase that I like is, uh, is it truth or is it truthy? Mm -hmm. um, and how important is that? Uh, but, uh, you know, documentary for years, forever probably, has used um, stock footage or recreations. So, we consider that generally ethical. It does tend to surprise the audiences sometimes when they discover it. Um, but I, I think to me, you know, if I'm cutting in a shot of a shark inside Verite footage, but I, I need a shot of a shark, we buy it from a stock house. It has to be the right shark that only occurs in that location, not one that only is in the Pacific and we're filming in the Atlantic. There's gotta be a veracity to it or we're just making shit up <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that's okay, but sometimes it's really not. Matthew, I think I recall you saying something about sourcing sound as well. Like it needs to be sort of specific to a location or to uh, um, like, I'll, I'll invite you to elaborate rather than put the words in your mouth. But, it, but Carol's comment jogged my memory of something you'd, you'd mentioned in our prep call. Um, yeah, just, well, I mean, oftentimes we're asked to uh, put in sounds that are accurate to the location, like, of the film. Um, so that's one thing. But I would say that, you know, generally speaking, if, if you don't have that sound, you're going to put in a sound that sounds what you think is similar to that. So, I mean, so much of my job is an illusion that it's, you know, I don't really think about things in the way that Carol's sort of framing them. I, I see where Carol's coming from for sure because she's crafting the story from the footage with the director. And those conversations are obviously very important, especially depending on what kind of subject matter we're dealing with. But by the time it comes to me, it's sort of just like, okay, well, we, we don't have any sound. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we pull ourselves into this film and become close to the subject? Or how do we steer clear and present the information? But you know, all of that is, really fabricated, I guess, um, on my end. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, certainly. Um, and I'd love to hear from, from Darren and she as well. I mean, one of the, one, one of the issues that I, that I think has come up in, uh, in composing, especially, you know, the, you know, we're in a certain place you want to hear music from, that you know you want to hear music to that, to that specific area you know and then the question of authenticity and then also cultural appropriation comes up as well too mm. and i think that's that's a challenge because that you know i can write pretty good music that sounds like it's from you know the caribbean or from or you know from peru or whatnot but the thing is you know then the question again becomes from an ethical standpoint is this you know, how authentic is this? You know, are you appropriating? And, and, and I think certain, definitely there are certain cultures that you tend to kind of 
treat a little bit more delicately with more kid gloves than you would with other ones. Like, I don't think anyone's going to blink an eye, an eye if we're in France and I put an accordion, right? You know, but if, <laughs> if we're, um, you know, and, and one particular concern, you know, um, is for example, indigenous music here within Canada, you know, that you really want to be respectful of how you treat that both from an authenticity and just from a, uh, an author and from a respect standpoint as well too. So that's, uh, you know, I don't really know, this is answering your question, but I think it's just something that it's a challenge that's um, evolving, you know, I guess as, as craft evolves too. No, that's a really good um, ethical dimension to consider is not just sort of the truth value of something, but it's, it's, it's uh, cultural authenticity as well. Um, she, back to my original question about sort of balancing the, um, you know, the artistic narrative and intervention versus its truth value. How do you find that balance yourself? I think it's always a, a, it's a very big subject. And then I also feel like it's a, it's one of the core uh, debate in documentary films, whether we go with the realism or the rawness or, or we go with like a certain kind of artistic creations. And, and I think like with, with editing, it's always a form of manipulation in a way of like the footage and the storyline and then the, the timeline sometimes and there was I think it, it's um it that we are kind of like this guard as well that we have to make some hard decisions sometimes not to go too far I think it's a it's very important for editor to to ask the question and then not just follow like I think it's a more we we would all often go with a more organic approach with like we try to find organic moment that flows with another organic moment and then it forms something instead of like forcefully I feel like in the past when I was a younger editor and then I try to force some of the storylines together and then normally it didn't work out mm -hmm. and and I think it's also um, because the story and the character on its own has its own logic and I think there is some something very true about the way that it's documented that you just cannot alter. And I think, but my biggest question was like, sometimes I feel like we have a lot of uh, beautifully shot films and then um, would that like poetry or the this pursuit of beauty and cinema like overkill the rawness of the reality? That's, that's a question that I ask a lot because like sometimes, um, I know that like in, in China, there was like uh, a lot of uh, grassroots production, like very, very indie films. And then sometimes they come up with like very strong subject or like I, I think in a lot of countries where I have like less production budget for, for documentary films, sometimes the rawness and the power of those footage are stronger than when it's like properly shot, like with establishing shots and then people walking that are basically like it's clearly, there are staging elements in, in some of the, the films that, yeah. Mm. Um, I'm mindful that we're coming up on uh, our opportunity for the audience to submit their questions. So uh, just a reminder to folks watching that if you do uh, have anything that you'd like to post to the panel, you can use the Q&A box uh, to do so and I'll get to those shortly. Um, but just on this topic for a moment more, uh, there was a, an example that I brought up uh, in our prep call uh, it was a 2019 film called Honeyland, which is a really gorgeous piece of filmmaking about a woman who keeps bees in rural Macedonia. Uh, and it really has the style and narrative shape of a drama. It's a very rich piece of storytelling. Uh, and there are two moments during the film where the character is tooting a radio. And in both cases, a well-known pop song is playing. Uh, the first instance occurs maybe midway through the film and the second happens right at the end. And that last moment is sort of the perfect accent to this melancholy um, feeling situation. Uh, and, you know, when I was first watching it, I thought like, that's a really crazy coincidence that, um, you know, that song would have been on the radio twice at these key moments as the cameras were rolling. And, you know, sure enough, having spoken to one of the filmmakers, uh, that moment was in fact a manipulation. You know, they replaced uh, the songs that were actually playing on the radio for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was sort of that artistic reason of, of giving that moment uh, at the end uh, a bit more, 
evocative resonance. And then the other reason was actually just that they didn't have a huge budget. And so uh, it was most cost effective for them to reuse the song that they had licensed. Um, I, you know, I wonder about different styles of, of nonfiction filmmaking and, and films like Honeyland that are um, maybe not so much about investigating, uh, you know, or exposing um, some journalistic matter. They're more about uh, uh, mood and feeling versus uh, your more kind of traditional uh, journalistic expose docs. Do you, do you each sort of feel that there might be interventions that, you know, are justified in, in, in one form of documentary that, that maybe would overstep the mark in others? Um, maybe Matthew, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, um, you, you know, you, you have to be, I was reading, I was listening to an interview with Steve Boddicker, who was a sound designer on The Dissident, um, the Jamal Khashoggi documentary. And so he, he talked about, um, with the director, they talked about, you know, they could make this film very, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a lot of like, you know, overlays of like visual effects and, and things like that with like, you know, raw audio. Um, so they talked about making it really exciting and dramatic and really bold, but they had to pull it back in the mix because it felt like it was sort of like being a bit disingenuous to the topic of like, this is about someone's death. It's very serious. Um, and I think they did a good job of, of tempering that. And then, you know, I feel, I feel like I watched Honeyland and I was like, wow, this is like a beautiful story. And my wife was sort of like, well, that, that just feels like I watched this most amazing film. And then I read, you know, about it and how it was manipulated and the backstory of the area she comes from has a very complicated political history um, that wasn't acknowledged in the film. And you're sort of like, and, and my wife was like, she was feeling pretty duped. Um, I try not to feel duped. I try to just sort of take it at, taste, at face value because clearly the director, like that, he, they, they presented the film they wanted to present, you know, so. I'm curious if if uh, if any of our other panelists have thoughts, not necessarily specifically about Honeyland. <laughs> you know, I, I think the role that music plays is really dependent on. And again, just to go back to what Matthew was saying, was just about you know what what is what is the film the director is trying to make. You know, I mean, in one of the terms that Naomi Thompson uses with me often, who I did you know uh, Equus and Human Odyssey with. Um, he, he'd, he'd always complain that my, sometimes that my music was too emotionally bossy, right? Mm. Whereas that, in the sense that I was trying too hard to tell people what to, to, to think, or that I think that sometimes that's exactly what you want. And then other times, you know, you don't want that. And I think that, um, you know, it, to, to, to give the cop an answer to you, Julian, you know, I think it, you know, it, it really depends on the film. You know, I, I think that, you know, and, and, and a director's vision of the film, and, and, and that goes on top of that in terms of, you know, your audience, your, 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 your um, the way that the medium in which people are consuming, you know, the film. I think that all goes into consideration in, in terms of what's appropriate and what's not and what's overreaching and what's not. So um, there you go, there's my, there, there's my two cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like um, the beauty of documentary films is that it has, the possibility of having variety of point of views and forms. So I think that it, if the directors wanted to present the film as it's a historical accurate or a, a, a something about social um, political uh, issues, I think Honeyland would definitely not, not work. But I feel like it really depends on how the directors um, they their intention in going into filming and their intention in making the film and then how they presented the film is is it like coherent with their pursuit i feel like there are just so many ways to go even like for for instance last year i was very fascinated by it, like because there are so many covid films and then all of them were taken from different angles and then they tried to diversify so much of the different content and then i do feel like okay there are different there are just many, many ways and many um, pursue that we can go in regarding in making a film. And then it is just like, we have to stay truthful to that. And we, if we are making something very serious and historically 
accurate or social political issues. I feel like it is a problem if we go too much into um, artistic or like manipulation or um, you know overly using some of the the tools in in making the cinema. But it can be also powerful in representing certain truths. So like to highlight a certain group of people and to highlight certain stories, maybe it's a it's a good tool to use. I think it's a it's more come up to a personal choice at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol, I'll, I'll come to you and then we can go to some uh, audience Q&A questions. I, I, I think just the same as everybody's been saying, it's, it's an individual choice of the filmmaker. I think it has to be appropriate to the content. Um, the same with making a fiction film. Sometimes you want to impose a style on something that isn't appropriate mm -hmm. to the story um, or, or may not feel that way, but then the director's vision pulls it out. Um, you know, you can tell an emotional story intimately with a camera in your subject's face, or you can tell it formally from a distance. It gives the audience different feelings um, in watching that. And, and again, the same goes in documentary, how you choose to film it from the beginning uh, informs how we cut it and, and can inform the choices that we make in terms of um, everything from graphics or animations to music to sound. Um, with mixing, you know, you could choose to have your audio right up front and hear the intimacy of breaths and footsteps um, or, or have that very muted or even absent. Mm -hmm. it's, it changes the way you read a film. Um, and some of that stuff, some of the choices that we make are about context and, and audience. Um, while you were speaking, uh, I was thinking about the film Varunga, mm -hmm. which is set, you know, during a, a conflict, <clears throat> excuse me, in Varunga Park in, uh, in the Congo, uh, they chose to have a, a history lesson at the beginning of the film, which uh, some friends of mine, when we talked about it, they thought it was unnecessary and a little kind of condescending of the filmmakers mm -hmm. to do it. I knew so little about those conflicts. I knew superficially the long history of, of that country. Um, but I felt like it, it really provided an intimate way into the story. This is what they're dealing with outside the park and it's leading into the park. So, you know, some people liked it, some people didn't. I found it effective um, to introduce me to the situation in a larger sense so that I could get that intimate story of the rangers and the animals in that park. Mm. So, you know, it's, a, it's yet another storytelling device that we can use. Um, Lots of options. Yeah, that's that's so often a consideration that comes up when you're making a documentary with the international market in mind is, is how much context to provide uh, to kind of allow the audience to then be drawn into the, you know, maybe more emotional minutia of your story. But if they, you know, if they don't have that grounding, it'll be harder for them to maybe access. So um, yeah, that's certainly a, a, a consideration that I recognize. Um, Carol, maybe I'll, I'll stay with you for our first question from the audience, which is uh, about stock footage. And you had mentioned stock footage earlier. The question is, I'm currently cutting a doc. I'm just gonna use some stock footage to simulate some of what was being said. Um, I'm afraid that if I do, uh, then people may be drawn out of the story and, and maybe won't be listening uh, quite as attentively to uh, the subject. So um, how do you, strike a balance in that sort of situation if you're using stock footage to, um, I guess, illustrate or uh, accentuate um, something that a subject is saying? Um, I want it to be appropriate to the scene. I want it to be, um, I, I, it's so individual. <laughs> it's, it's um, if the voice is the thing that's driving the scene, then the footage, uh, in a way is secondary um, that you, you, you might choose to cut the scene for voice first and then figure out the rhythm of the picture um, on top of that. Uh, I think that's one of those situations where it's helpful to cut the scene and then show it to somebody else because if they're not getting what you want from the scene, then perhaps you have to reapproach, you know, reconsider your approach to the scene. Mm. Um, and, and sorry, there's, been a clarification. The question is, is, is not just about the use of the stock footage, but also whether to 
label it, which I think oh, is, is quite yeah. pertinent to. Um, Definitely. Well, yeah. That's, that's, it's a, it's a, it's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do this all the time uh, with stock footage. Uh, you know, we don't have a shot that we need, that we feel we need to tell the story. So we buy stock footage. Uh, some filmmakers commission it. Um, there are different ways of getting the shots that you need if you haven't filmed them yourself. Uh, I would say, depending on the context, sometimes labeling it would take your audience out of the moment that they would be reading the title and thinking, why did they choose to do this? As opposed to just experiencing it. But it might be relevant, it might be important for the audience to know that it's that it's a simulation or recreation or, or stock footage. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it's so it's so individual that also like style wise, maybe that's something you choose to do throughout the whole film. Or if this is a unique situation within the film, maybe you label it to show its uniqueness to highlight that specialness of that scene. Right. So if if uh you know, if you're using stock footage that is essentially um, you know, not hugely unique in the sense that you're illustrating, you know, you're talking about um, polar bears or sharks, as you were saying earlier, uh, maybe, you know, you don't need a label if, if it's, if it's uh, sort of a generally illustrative stock piece of footage that you're using. But if you're, if you're, um, you know, if, if there, if the moment that's being recreated is, is a bit more specific or, um, there's the implication that, that the moment that we're seeing has sort of some special, uh, you know, circumstance to it, perhaps that then requires, um, perhaps that needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. there's always going to be credits at the end. You have to credit all your stock. So, you know, again, the credit will be there. It just may not be on screen. Um, you know, this makes me think of the Anthony Bourdain thing, of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yes. You know, should should that um, AI created line or lines been acknowledged somehow on screen? Um, if the filmmaker hadn't told us, we'd never know. How important is it? Is it important? Is it important just because it's Anthony Bourdain? Mm. Um, can of worms. Not, yeah, not, not to pass the buck. But. <laughs> uh, since that is um, very much sort of the topic of the moment, I think, in, in the documentary community, I'd love to hear from, from each of our panelists on it, uh, that question of um, sort of how overt you need to be in labeling uh, things like this, whether it's stock footage or as maybe increasingly possible, uh, sort of AI generated uh, either audio or video. Um, you know, I, I'm curious about your thoughts, both as filmmakers and then also people who are, you know, sitting down to watch these things. And then um, we do have another question that I would love to get to, but I, I wanted to address this just because we are certainly on the topic. Um, well, I, so I, I haven't seen Roadrunner and I haven't heard the clips in question, but I was looking to it and I guess there's like two or three products readily available out there that I think anyone can access. It isn't some sort of like you have to go and spend a hundred thousand dollars to some special company to have it done. So I would say that, you know, if those tools are coming, they're going to be employed. They're already being employed. They're going to be employed more often. Who knows how often it's been done before this film. And I think it's just another tool in the toolbox that people are going to have to use. And, you know, back to what we were saying earlier, really it's, it's a case by case basis, whether it's, you know, disingenuous or, ethical to acknowledge that you're using it or not using it. I've never not, been asked to do. <laughs> <laughs> not, not having seen the, the Roadrunner doc either um, because I haven't brought myself to go back to theaters yet. Um, the question I, I would have for the filmmakers is, is Bourdain is renowned for rewriting and rewriting his own narration. Obviously he was in control of his own voice. Um, so perhaps it was unethical to use it in that case for him. But, you know, again, that was the choice they made. And had they not told us, we would never know. 
but you know, perhaps we'd figure it out. Um, why was he reading the line that we've heard about is a line from a, an email. So how did they get his voice? Um, perhaps they missed the boat and they, it would have been more emotionally powerful to not hear that AI recording because we know his voice so well, we'd, we'd fill it in. Mm. So maybe it would have been more powerful, but hey, I wasn't in the cut. So maybe it, it felt like a hole that they had to fill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting in the film itself, they actually employ a very conventional technique in cinema, which is they dissolve the audio or they fade the audio from um, the recipient of the email begins to read the email aloud and then they fade into Bourdain's voice sort of picking up the words. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's um, a very familiar cinematic choice, but obviously the actual material from which uh, it's constructed is, is, is new. And um, I think there are two, at least two dimensions of ethical question about one, you know, the choice to, to use this technique uh, and, and, you know, where a person is deceased and obviously can't actively consent to doing so. Um, but then also the question of whether you disclose it to the audience. Um, I think there are at least two dimensions that are that are very much open to question. Um, Darren and Chi, did you do you have thoughts on this? Um, I I generally have a big concern with deep fake technology, so I feel like your your two questions was very valid. I think uh, at least for for me, it, um, it's very important to for the audience to know that there are contents that are made by this technology. And um, the question of concern, uh, con consent, it, it's also like um, very important. But at the same time, I was imagining if he's not passed away, maybe he will be asked to read that letter. So that's for me a case by case thing. But I think the use of deep fake technology is just putting a lot of um, just putting a lot of pressure on the audience to identify whether it's which is truth or not. And it's increasingly hard for the audience to just like even with a critical mind, critical thinking mind, it's very hard. It's harder and harder to identify whether something we watch and hear is true or not. So um, and then it also comes with the question of like identity or like, like can, can all our face eventually be used or borrowed or leased uh, to use in the film? And I think it's a bigger question here. Mm. And no answer, but it's, it's something that concerns me quite a bit. Julian, I think you're the only one of us who saw it. Did, how, did, how did it feel? Like, did you know going in about it? Um, how did it feel when you watched it? Uh, so I did know, and um, I knew that there were three instances where apparently this technology had been used. And I found that I was mildly cognizant of searching when I was hearing the voiceover to try to sort of see if I could identify when it was being used. And so that's a pr probably a particular case where it was arguably slightly distracting for me that I think most audiences obviously wouldn't be going in with, with that knowledge. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in the moment I was, when I, when I heard the one, the one clip that I knew to be a, a, a recreation, um, I think I was struck by the very specific use of that fade where it's obvious that they, they had, you know, initially the recipient of the email just read it, which is, a very conventional way to, you know, give voice to somebody who is no longer with us. So it was, it was, it was all the more striking that the filmmaker felt that they, you know, they needed to put it in Bourdain's voice, so to speak, um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it was already being voiced, and so um, clearly this was a decision that was made uh, very intentionally. And I think, you know, my, my initial question was, was it about sort of perfectionism? Was it about having so much audio of this person and then having this one uh, element that, that for whatever reason wasn't voiced and feeling like you needed to just ensure that it, that it remained sort of in his voice 
wall to wall, but but it actually seemed more than that. It, it seemed like uh, Morgan Neville was making a very specific choice about the the specific words being spoken and uh, about wanting to put an emotion to them, which is all the more um, interesting because that's the one thing obviously that the AI can't do is it can recreate the the you know the phonemes and the the actual kind of sound of the voice, but it can't. We don't know the emotionality of uh, the, the the way that that would have been expressed specifically. So it's it's all I can say is that I was really struck by the the like intentional choice that was being made. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's come up again and again, talking about like filmmakers uh, having to kind of make or directors and working with directors and, and, and them making choices. You know, certainly it was a a choice mm -hmm. um, above all else. I uh, would I would question. <laughs> Or also like with, like if I, I was imagining if I were in that situation sitting with the director, would I be able to do this, like allow this to happen, or would I make a different choices? Would I object? Or like what would you do, Carol? Like if you, you know, <laughs> edit this reach, facing this kind of like ethical choices that you yeah. feel like problematic. We, I think it it would be discussed right up until the mix. Mm -hmm. It would be, you know, yeah. you know, and 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 discussed with a broader team, and mm -hmm. you know, it because it's a big, it's a big deal. I think yes. um, I'm not a fan of the deep fake stuff either. I think it has a use, but you know, what are we going to do? Put Marilyn Monroe in a documentary now? Because we we could, <laughs> you know, like it's how far do we go? I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I think I'm mindful, I sorry to interrupt. I'm mindful of our time, and there is one more question, and it 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 maybe is an opportunity. Uh, to bring Darren into the conversation uh, because we haven't had an opportunity for here to hear from you as much on this topic. Um, so I did I did want to just address it briefly while we while we have uh, a minute or so left. And it's it does relate. It's 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 it is in some ways about sort of pushing back on a director. The question is: um, Have there been instances where you, as a composer or a sound professional, have argued to not use sound or a soundtrack in certain scenes against a director's wishes uh, to potentially achieve a greater effect? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. I, I have. Um, I've I've lost that battle a couple of times. I won that battle a couple of times. <laughs> um, and and, and, and so, so the first first point to, to the question is kind of probably a little bit of a funnier thing, and that ties right into Mac. But often when I'm sitting in on a mix, I'll often actually suggest that the music go down lower. Not only as uh, for, for obviously there, there, there's a real dramatic reason that I'm suggesting that, but it's also a political thing as well too, because that. You know, if, if, if as a composer, I can say, listen, I'm thinking holistically about the film and not just advocating for my music, um, you know, that what I really want that music to be pushed up in that big, you know, in that big epic section there, it gives me a lot more street cred to do that. So that's one of the, one of the things. Um, and the the incident that I that I can think of that most readily where I, I suggested taking out music where I ended up losing, I had to write music for it. Um, <clears throat> it really had to deal with sort of perception of reality. I thought the scene would be a lot more powerful without music, um, but, and this is actually on Jeff, Jeff St. Jules' uh, most recent film. Uh, but then he said, the problem with me taking out the music is that it distorts our perception of reality. And so, which is a really, a real legitimate, you know, okay, I see your point and I will stand back from that, right? So it does happen. Uh, it does happen now. And I think it just, it really goes to just say, if you have a really, fantastic relationship with your with your director that you can have these honest conversations not just about no I want to do this because I, this is what I want you to do versus what's better for the film I think that's ultimately that's the ideal relationship that we want to be I think for all of us yeah I mean always and for the exact same reasons Darren mentioned and and, and then one thing composers probably swear at mixers for is editing their cues um, and we do that because we think it's, you know, like we're trying to separate an idea or we're trying to link an idea together. Um, but yeah, that happens all the time. That's that's a big part of my job is being like, do we need this sound? What is the sound here for? You know, what is this cue here for? So, yeah. I feel like we were we were just getting into some meaty conversations and I'm sure we could keep this going for a while, but uh, sadly we, we are out of time. So I did want to hand it back to Katie, but uh, but before I do so, say thanks once more. Uh, to each of you and, and to the Academy for uh, allowing me to participate in the conversation.
Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, Julian. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, I want to thank Carol, Darren, Matt, she and Julian for today's conversation. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your insight with us. Um, that was a really interesting conversation. And as Julian was saying, I feel like we could go on forever. These conversations always fly by. Um, I also wanted to give another huge thank you to our partners at the City of Toronto for presenting this session. If you are posting about this event on social media, don't forget to tag us in your posts. We are at the CDN Academy and the City of Toronto can be found at City of Toronto on Twitter and at City of TO on Instagram. Uh, thank you again so much, everyone. And I hope to see everyone again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Julian.